23. However, Broncos had a chance to win when Case Keenum missed Demarius Thomas near the end zone with 22 seconds left. Everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> See, how did Thomas get? I'm done. With, I'm just, just so you guys this know. Is it. You're I'm done finally with off. I will find someone else. How did he get else. so open? See, what the tight end is to his side. That safety, they're in cover two. The quarterback's going to jam him and let him go. The safety has two guys to read. He's got that inside tight end. That's what kept him in the middle of the field. You see the tight end releasing? That's why he was late getting to Merritt. This was a chance to win the game. So while we're sitting here talking about Kansas City, Mahomesy, hey, they could have lost this game. And easily last night, if an NFL quarterback was throwing that ball. But it wasn't. It was Case. They got a case of the cases. Case, the second yeah. least accurate. They need to get a prescription for Case in, oh. in, in Denver. I guarantee you they're going to have guy. stuff labeled Case in the cases in Denver. Second I'm just telling you. Second. It's going to be a downer, too. It's not an upper. It's going to be a down. You're going. going to get, and your stomach's going to hurt, too. Just go. Okay, Leonard go Fournette will stomach. be out indefinitely after aggravating his already injured hamstring. Fournette had already missed weeks two and three with the injury and left during the first half against the Jets in week four. See, how big of a deal is this for the Jaguars? It's a huge blow for them because the organization is built to be physical. That's why they went out and got Norville, the offensive guard. Norwell. Added him. Norwell. That's Andrew, um, and added him to the team, highest paid offensive guard in the league. So they're sending a physical presence. That's what Tom Coughlin does. That's what their head coach, Doug Marone, that's what they want to do. So when he's injured, their philosophy and how they want to win is altered because they only have one back on their roster that can play that style. I, I understand that part of it. And so because- It sounds good too. It, it, it makes sense. And so and I'm not, it, the reason that I don't think it's as big of a deal as a lot of people do is, I just don't think Leonard Fournette's been very productive as a pro. He but is, the reason why you don't spend money at wide receivers because you think you got a guy that can carry the ball 325 times. Fair enough. And so that even if he's not going to be high yards per carry, even just to be a workhorse, I get it. I think TJ Yeldon might be a better pro than Leonard Fournette. I think what Leonard Fournette's doing right now is replacement level. Now, maybe I'm way too far down on him. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of people in that corner with you. Okay. All right. And I think there will be... I think there will be more people on that corner as his career progresses. We'll see. I, I don't think it's a huge loss for him. Moving on to the Cowboys now, currently 2-2, two and two, with most of their success coming courtesy of Ezekiel Elliott. He leads the NFL in rushing, 88 yards more than second-place rusher Todd Gurley. See how impressive is Zeke's start to the year, considering the Cowboys' offensive struggles everywhere else. No, not with Zeke. I mean, the, they pay that offensive line, even with the injuries. The reason why they do, because they want to give the running back a chance to get to the second level. Zeke is a special runner with the football. Now, with the Dallas Cowboys being on that team, this is what we should expect from him. He should be one of the top rushers. So, if they're going to be successful, though, he's going to have to rush for 17, 50, 1,800 yards this season. It's wildly impressive. See, yeah. who was the only person who could hold Michael Jordan under 20 points a game? Oh, Dean Smith, the coach. Who's the the only person who can hold Zeke under 100 yards per game. Jason Garrett, evidently. Oh, because yeah, there's, there's Scott Linehan. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> the only reason he's not lapping the field mm -hmm. is in yard in rushing yards is because he hasn't had the opportunity. He's given you nearly six yards per carry on this volume of carries, and everyone knows that's what they want to do. Yes. They know they want to run the ball. They still can't stop them from running the ball. The quarterbacks win MVPs in this league. We get it. But he is having running back MVP level production through four games despite limited opportunities. All right, finally, the Eagles had an up-and-down first four games of their season. I mean, good news, Carson Wentz is back, and he looks good. The bad news is they're 2-2, two and two, and they've got an NFC Championship rematch on the way this Sunday against the Minnesota Vikings. Head coach Doug Peterson admitted he needs to see more from this team. Our understanding that for us to play like champions... Um, first of all, we have to understand that, that we are champions and, and you have to play. You're, you're expected to play a certain way, um, coaches and players here in, in Philadelphia with the Eagles. And it's my expectation. And um, when you don't live up to that expectation, we, we, need, to, we need to just zero down on it and, 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 and figure out why. And uh, um, the, the sense of urgency from players and coaches uh, – needs to needs to, to sort of heighten just a little bit it's not a panic mode but it's a it's a heightened awareness of of who we are as a football team where we want to get to
All right, Nick, what was your reaction to Coach Peterson? If they have to play with more of a sense of urgency, wouldn't you assume that at this point I, every game will I, be approached that way? I don't think that's the correct diagnosis for what's going on with Philadelphia. I don't think it's a lack of sense of urgency. I think this is maybe you're, you're talking to the media, you're finding words. and it, I think it's a lack of execution. I think it's a lack of execution by their secondary, most notably at the end of games. I think that... They became so reliant on a dominant pass rush that maybe last year we overrated how effective their secondary was. They also lost Patrick Robinson, a guy who was a saint and then went to Philly and now is back in New Orleans as a very effective nickel corner. And when they haven't had a dominant pass rush the way they did last year, they had a good pass rush but not a dominant pass rush, that secondary is being exposed. And that loss to Tennessee is a bad loss. Tennessee's not a bad team, but you're up 17 to three in a game that you have full control over. And to end up losing that football game, now you're sitting at two and two in that tough NFC. You're a team that who, my question for the Eagles right now, my concern for the Eagles see is who are they? What is the Philadelphia Eagles identity right now other than defending Super Bowl champions? Because first two weeks you don't have Wentz, then you do have Wentz. They haven't yet had the, okay, that is their dominant performance. And so I, I think the concern in Philadelphia is warranted. Well, the reason why they became world champs because they had the best offensive line and defensive line, even though they had made some serious changes with injuries, on both of those units. Uh, they have not gotten the level of quarterback play that they got in the NFC Championship game and the Super Bowl. But the part that I didn't like about the press conference is that, that he, he's wrong about is they're not champions. They're not, it's not, it's not boxing. Like, you were last year's champ. It's not like you're gonna hand the trophy to whoever's it, no. That's over with. That and was Malcolm Jenkins' thing before the year about the poster in the locker room. And there's so much turnover. Yeah. There's 30% turnover on every team every year. So what about Mike Wallace? He wasn't there. What about Matthews? He wasn't there. Are they champions too? So you're sending a message to a team that that's not what teams who have won the championship and being the Patriots, that's not what they talk about. They're the only team that can really say we're champions and they don't do it. There's a theory and there's a reason why with such parity around the NFL, why we haven't seen someone repeat for as long as we have, that you can't be relying on what you did last year. There's too much turnover on each roster and injuries are real. But I'm just gonna go back to their center who had an amazing speech um, at the Kelsey. parade, Jason Kelsey, when they were accepting all the accolades and everything. What he said was, he talked about all the excuses about them being underdogs, how people had given up. With all those names he mentioned, those guys aren't playing well. Lane Johnson not playing well, all right? The center's not playing well. The left tackle, he's not playing well. The quarterback could play better. And defensively, that's where they can play better. So for me, it's about those players playing better. I believe that there is a sense of urgency, but they did not have a great training camp and they have not had a first good uh, month of the season. So I believe that the players have a sense of urgency, but it's about playing better. This is a team that really enjoyed their off season. They wrote books, they did the media tour, they were on the radio, they took full advantage of the national stage and the spotlight. And you wonder whether they lost a little bit of focus coming in. Maybe not, but I wonder if they lost a little focus coming into this season that, okay, we already know how to do it, so that's the easy part. Now we can just go play football as opposed to what we always hear Mangini said, a new season is brand new, whatever happened, happened, and we're all starting at the exact same place on the starting line. Well, I think you forget where you are as an organization at some point. We knew at some point they would struggle. It might have been in December, might have been in November, it just happens to be in the first month. This is the best month that you want to struggle. They've only had their quarterback in two games, all right? So also, they don't have some of the injuries that other teams have to be able to overcome as you go throughout the season. I just think that they should have moved on from who they were trying to create. What type of identity are we going to be this year? Last year in the playoffs, they were RPO, get after the quarterback, don't give up big plays, all right? When are they gonna get back to that or whatever version they are of that this year? And the best thing they have going for them right now is they won that game against Atlanta in week one when Atlanta had the goal to go to win, and they are in a division that is going to be winnable 
all year long. The Giants are a mess with the Cowboys have no air aerial attack and Washington is a to be determined having the bye in week four sitting at two and one. So even with a stop and start beginning of the season, Philadelphia has as much wins as any team in their division. So they, they can be fine, but they have to play better. But one thing we determined from last year, if they don't have home field advantage, yes. they're not Super Bowl champs. So now, with their struggle, now you're looking at going on the road somewhere, potentially going to L.A. to face the Rams. That's not something that I think the Philadelphia is in their best interest. Right. Huge home field advantage. Last year, Nick and I were there to get a piece of it. All right, let's move on. An update now on the Lavian Bell saga. According to reports, L. Bell does, in fact, want to play for the Steelers this season, and he will, in fact, join his teammates during the bye week in Week 7. That means he would miss matchups against the Falcons and Bengals, and he'd return for a Week 8 matchup against the Browns. Steelers are 28th in the NFL in rushing yards per game. All right, Chris, can the Steelers survive without Le'Veon Bell until Week 8? Of course they can. I mean, they've survived as a franchise. They've only had three head coaches. They have done well. The head coach they have now, Mike Tomlin, people criticize him, but he's never had a losing record. So that's been without Ben. That's been without L. Bell. That's been without a, with all their star players um, that he's been able to accomplish that. So I don't expect them to have a losing season. I mean, this is the part of doing business, and this is kind of the bad part about Mike Tomlin as a coach because sometimes you don't have control over what the organization is gonna do as far as how they're going to spend their money. And I believe that this franchising L Bell should be a test case around the NFL that potentially what you can do to your team and what you can do to your locker room. Because as a running back, when L Bell got franchised, it has not been a good thing. So he has had to put on a selfish approach because of what's pending with him going forward. He's got to be able to look out for what's the best interest of myself and my body. Like if they put another 350 touches, 400 touches on him, it will affect his career. We've seen it. Like we can't avoid history. So I don't have a problem with L. Bell trying to get what he feels like he's worth. But because he's been suspended twice. And I've said this a long time ago when they franchised, Pittsburgh Steelers were not going to sign him to a long-term deal because the money they were going to put in Ben, the money they were going to put in AB, and he's one suspension away from being away from the Pittsburgh Steelers for an indefinite amount of time. So I believe that affected it, but also that team deciding in year number two to put that franchise tag back on him, it's affected that locker room in a negative way. And everyone should read the interview he did with Jeremy Fowler because he lays out very clearly, and you can choose to believe him or not, that he always planned to play football this year, that it was purely a calculated decision based on what CC alluded to, which was, I did not think it was in my best interest in a approaching a contract year to have 400 carries, to have 400 touches, pardon me. He, he is the NFL all-time record holder in touches per game. He had 405 last year. And so he is making the conscious decision to sacrifice nearly $5 million of salary to miss the first six games of the year to show up in week seven, which is their buy. And I, he says in there, like he wants to play in big games, wants to play in playoff games. Now, the Steelers are gonna have to find a way to split these next two games at least. Like if they go 0-2 against Atlanta and Cincy, and they're one, four, and one, then when he comes back, their season playoff wise is over already. Two, three, and one, that's doable. Obviously, three, two, and one, and they'll, they're fine. And the Falcons and the Bengals defenses can get got, but the team needs him. Their defense is not going to get any better, but that running game can get better. I understand your point, the franchise holistically doesn't need him, but as far as week to week, the last three weeks, they're the worst rushing team in football. So getting the best or second best running back in football football back will obviously help them. Does it affect what the Steelers decide to do, whether they want to trade him or not, him coming back when he says he's going to come back week eight? I think it probably did affect them because, I mean, they didn't know when he was going to come back. Well, we know he's going to come back week number 10. He's not going to give away the season. So him saying, oh, I planned on playing football. Well, of course, because it's in your best interest. Like, you would be an idiot. To, to avoid Sit out the, the whole year, the whole year. like again. you wouldn't accomplish one thing. <laughs> I mean, besides your your one year older and your fourteen and a half million dollars less in in your pocket. But what what I'm concerned about is because he's made this proclamation. What happens if okay, say he comes back week number eight, we make the playoffs. In the playoffs, everyone's injured. Does he play in the playoffs if he's injured? 
because I'm concerned about moving forward. Like, if I got a sprained ankle, everyone else out here is hurt, will I join my teammates in trying? He said, I want to play in big games, nothing bigger than the playoffs. So will he play then? So for me, if I'm the Pittsburgh Steelers, I move on from him. Because I'm, I'm not going to have to answer that question. I'm not going to have to pose that to my team. Do we have a guy in the locker room that when it gets tough and when I need him the most, that he might decide that it's not in his best interest to be there? I would move on from him immediately. I would try to trade him. And that is, the timing of this leaves that open. Because if he was not go, set a date that he was coming back, no team would trade for him without knowing he's going to sign a long-term extension and knowing that he was going to, but he has to still sign. Won't know. Well, right, but he has to sign the franchise tag when he shows back up. Once that happens, then he can be traded without his consent. A team like this like year. you mentioned yesterday, yeah, like you mentioned yesterday, Philadelphia, a team that might say, you know what, it's worth giving up a second round pick if we think we're going to get Le'Veon Bell for the next eight, the final eight games of the year, because the trade deadline is the day after week eight. So if he comes back week seven, they would have two weeks to shop him if their season is by the right. wayside or if they're worried about how dedicated he would be to the team moving forward. All right, we shall see. One more segment coming up. Can anyone slow down the Chiefs in the AFC? That's next. This is called First Things First. Buddy Ryan told a guy, told the general manager to trade the guy. So listen.